So I'm going to start out today talking about every endurance athlete's favorite topic, poop. Yes, poop. So we all love to talk about poop. We stress out about, are we going to poop before the race? We want to make sure that happens. Are we going to not poop during the race? So there's a lot of worry about that. And then we worry about all the gas, the bloating, the GI distress that can happen during a race. And you know, by the time you get to the run in a triathlon, typically, you're going to hear a lot of bodily functions. You're going to go into the porta potty, see things you don't want to see. Um, it's just kind of the way it is. And um, one, a very famous pro triathlete, I won't name her, but you could read her book, um, arguably one of the best. Uh, she tells in her book that she literally pooped her pants in every Ironman race she did except for one. And she did a lot of them. So uh, I like to think, though, that although this is common, doesn't mean it's normal, right? And I personally have dealt with it. I, did, I started doing endurance sports over 15 years ago. And everything was going great. First Ironman, fine, wonderful. Second Ironman, I get, I'm on the bike. I'm just shoving in carbohydrates, right? Because the formula says I need to take in 250 calories of carbohydrate per hour. My coach, you know, telling me this over and over. So I'm on the bike. I'm shoving in liquid nutrition, some gels, some goos. And I'm putting it down, and it's like, ugh, this doesn't feel very good. But then the dreaded fear of the bonk happening on the run if I don't get this in, right? And then my coach's voice in the back of my head, you need to take this in. You need to get it in. So I'm shoving it in. You know, you're sitting on the bike. OK, maybe it's working. Maybe it's not. And then I get onto the run, stand up, start running. And I'm like, oh my god, this is not going to be good. So I pretty much suffered through an entire marathon, visited a lot of porta potties and didn't feel great, obviously. Very happy to cross that finish line. I ended up in the med tent. I couldn't really digest food very well for a few days after that. I mean, my stomach was just pretty much ripped up. If you've heard of leaky gut, that's definitely something that was going on. And it typically will happen at the end of a race anyway. But then when you're shoving all this food in and trying to digest it, you're going to increase your chances of that. And so I think I told my husband, I am not racing Ironman again. Well, that lasted, I don't know, maybe six months. And, but then I had this wonderful opportunity. I was doing my master's in nutrition therapy. And you get this fun project called a thesis, right? So I thought, OK, why don't I do something that I'm passionate about, something that really matters to me? And so I decided to really focus on nutrition for endurance athletes and how can we reduce GI distress. So I started my research looking for a magical carbohydrate formula. And a lot of the research that you go to, you know, there's, there's a ton out there. And a lot of it, though, when you look beyond everything, is sponsored by the, the different sports nutrition product makers. So, you know, Goo has their research, Gatorade, who really started it, um, and, you know, Hammer. They all have their research on why their special formula is going to work well for you. And it is true that we do need a mixture of fructose, glucose, maltodextrin um, to digest well because we do have, have different transporters. And so it will get to your cells more quickly. But at the same time, when even reading all that research, there's really no magical formula. There's no answer to say, OK, I can, I can put in this exact product in this amount per hour, and it's going to digest well, and it's going to work for me. And there's a big reason for that. So um, when we're out training and racing, our bodies are just not made to digest. So our autonomic nervous system has two parts to it, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. And the sympathetic is the fight or flight. We love it. It sends all the blood flow out to our muscles. It makes us go fast. But then on the opposite side, you have the parasympathetic. It's the rest and digest. So it helps us to relax. Obviously, it really helps us to digest. So we can't digest well when we're stressed out and we're in a sympathetic mode. And that's one of the reasons why I tell clients, when you eat, I, I would like you to just be focused on eating, doing something relaxing. If you have to watch TV, don't watch the news, you know, things that will stress you out. So, uh, so when we're out training, we're sending all the blood flow out to our muscles, and the blood flow is not going to the GI tract. And so then that slows down the digestion. And then when you put food in, it's going to sit there longer. And then the more you put in, it's got to go somewhere. It's going to come up. It's going to go down. 
Um, and then when you add the pounding effect of running, you're going to get a lot more secretions into your large intestine, hence diarrhea. So all of this stuff is happening that's really preventing us from being able to digest. And so what are we supposed to do? Well, we can start to rely on our own body resources to, um, to provide the fuel that we need. And so there's two main fuel sources that we're going to use when we're out uh, training and racing, and that's going to be carbohydrates or fat. We don't want to use protein. Protein is our muscles. We don't want to break that down. So when we look at our sources, uh, we can store a certain amount of each of them. So carbohydrate, you know, you carbo load all week, you follow the rules, you go to the pasta pre-race party and, you know, eat tons of it. So you're, you're fully loaded. But at the end, you can only store 1,500 to 2,000 calories of carbohydrate. The rest is just going to go to fat. And a lot of you, if you've gone through a taper, you know, we all get cranky during the taper period. And part of it can be if you're carb loading, you end up feeling really puffy and, and you know, you gain some weight and all this when you're trying to get to race weight. And a lot of that's happening because you can only store so many carbs and the rest is going to fat. So um, alternately, with fat, we actually have a capability to store quite a bit of it. So even a lean athlete has a fair amount of body fat on it. So for me, um, I calculate what, um, what pace I need to I go in an Ironman and how much body fat I have. And I have, I have 60 hours of body fat on me. So I can do five Ironman races back to back on my body fat. So <laughs> there's plenty there, right? So the question is, how do we get to it, right? So the problem is that we've been told for the last 30 years that we need to eat all these carbohydrates. For sports nutrition, we need to eat it. We're told carbohydrates are the preferred fuel source. Well, actually, when we get to endurance sports, intensity is going to drive what you, um, what you are burning in any sport. And so if your intensity is not quite as high, you're going to burn more fat and less carbohydrates. So, and it kind of goes along a continuum in that way. So when we're out doing a longer distance sport, our intensity is not quite as high and you can access more of your body fat. But the other part is, is that when we're eating carbohydrates all the time, that can prevent you from the ability to burn your fat. So when we eat carbohydrates, our body starts to break it down, gets down into the small intestine. Once it gets to the form of glucose, it comes out of the small intestine, and then it's in the bloodstream and needs to get into the cells. So our pancreas is gonna release the hormone um, insulin, and then insulin has a lock and key relationship with the glucose. So it's going to open the cells, the glucose comes in. So insulin is obviously very important for us. However, if we have too much insulin in the bloodstream, the, shell, the cells can sort of shut down to it, or, um, or we can be in a, a purely storage state. So insulin is a fat storage hormone. It opens up cells, things go in. Things do not come out when you have insulin in the bloodstream. So to get at our body fat, we need to reprogram our body. And with our body fat, we have two main sources that we're going to access when we're out training and racing. So you have body fat in your muscles. It's called intramuscular triglycerides. And when you do aerobic training, you actually become more efficient at burning that. Because all it needs to do is get into the mitochondria, which is our fat burning powerhouse. It gets in there. Um, with carnitine, and it gets, and we burn it up. So when you do aerobic training, you're out there for hours and hours, that's going to make you better at burning the intramuscular triglycerides. However, most of our body fat is in our adipose tissue throughout the body. So in order to get at that, it's a much different process. And so fat is stored as triglycerides, and you may know triglycerides from, it's on a cholesterol panel. But so it's three um, fatty acids attached to a glycerol molecule. So within the fat cell, we need to break that apart. And that's a hormone called hormone-sensitive lipase, which works um, in opposition to insulin. So when you have insulin from eating carbohydrates in your bloodstream, the hormone-sensitive lipase is not going to work. So there, there again is a reason why you can't access your um, fatty stores when you're burning all these carbohydrates. So then it needs to break apart. Then it needs a protein carrier to get out of the fat cell. Then it needs to bind to albumin in your red blood cells, go through the bloodstream to the muscle, 
get into the muscle again with the protein carrier, and then the carnitine again to the mitochondria. So there's a lot that needs to happen. And the body's really smart. It's going to become more efficient at what we ask it to do all the time. So if you're eating carbohydrates all the time, your body's gonna be spitting out this insulin all the time. If you're eating fat, your body's gonna upregulate hormone-sensitive lipase, it's gonna upregulate the proteins, the carriers, and you'll become more efficient at um, burning fat. And the other thing that happens is you can improve, your body's gonna be more responsive to insulin because remember I'd said that your body will start to shut down when so much insulin is in, coming in all the time because you're eating carbohydrate after carbohydrate after carbohydrate. So when you, when you slow it down a little bit, your cells are gonna be more responsive so that, and you may know if you take gels now while, while you train and race, you know how often you need it. I mean, I knew it was like, I would take a gel, I'd get this big boost of energy, and then 40 minutes later, boom, crash. I need another gel. And so, and you can even notice that that will become a shorter period of time, and that means that your cells are getting less responsive to that insulin. So what we wanna do then is turn our bodies into fat burners. So it's the opposite of what we've been told. We actually have to eat fat to burn fat. So how do we do that? Well, you're gonna, it's really actually pretty simple. So you're just gonna increase your intake of healthy fats. And healthy fats would be um, not the corn or the vegetable oils and things like that. We want good, stable oils. So it's going to be your saturated fats, the coconut oil, the avocado oil. You want pasture butter, um, pasture eggs, and the fats that come from your meats and fish. You want them from quality products. And the reason being is that fat can be inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. So you probably know about omega-6 and omega-3 fats. So if we eat fat from an animal... Um, such as the butter, if we eat that from an animal that's eating the quality food that they're supposed to eat, they're going to have more omega-3 fats, they're going to be you know, um, less inflammatory, and then they also have something called conjugated linoleic acid, which actually helps us to burn fat. So you want to start to add more of that into your diet. And then with carbohydrates, we still need them. They're very important for us. However, I, we want to rethink how we're approaching our carbohydrates. And I like to think of it as a controlled carbohydrate approach. It's not necessarily low carbohydrate, um, but vegetables first. And so it's going to be the non-starchy vegetable first. So that's mainly the vegetables in your salads, um, the cruciferous vegetables, you know, broccoli, cauliflower. Brussels sprouts. And if you look at my plates, I mean, they're just piled with vegetables, mainly vegetables. And then, so there's a lot of them that's coming in from a volume wise, but from a percent of my calories, it's not, it's not that much. And then, um, and then you want to look at next will be the starchy vegetables. So the sweet potato, the squash, the red potatoes, those types of things you're going to add in. And particularly if you're a big volume athlete, you're going to add those in before your bigger training days, after your training days, because you really need to think about eating to train tomorrow. And so, and the best time to eat those more starchier carbohydrates are going to be at night so that you're replenishing and restoring so that you can go again. And I also like fruit, but fruit, um, fruit people have to be careful about because fruit does still have a lot of sugar. So people have to see what your tolerance for it is. And you'll know if you start to eat a lot of fruit, um, you can start to add a little weight. Um, you'll notice you have more sweet cravings. You can go uh, fewer amount of time between meals. That means that you're maybe too much fruit for you. But one fruit that I think is really important is the dark berries because they have a lot of antioxidants. When we're out training and racing, we're creating a lot of oxidative waste and the antioxidants are gonna help us with that. So I think dark berries should be included. And then the rest of the fruit, you can decide what you need. Um, I personally really just eat dark berries a few times a week um, and I really don't eat any other fruit. Um, and then you get to the unrefined grains. So like the brown rice, the, the long grain rice, the quinoa. And those can be added as needed, but I think, you know, once a person gets more accustomed to this, you can, you can take those things out completely. And then the refined grains, the sweets, I like to call them garbage. They really have no, no purpose whatsoever, right? So we want to get rid of those completely. And then for meals, you want to make sure that with your, uh, with your meals, you would have a protein and a fat with every meal. So a breakfast might be 
some pasture eggs cooked in um, pasture butter with a bunch of vegetables. And so there you've got your carbohydrate, your protein, your fat. And then for snacks, you want to have a protein or a fat with it. And you'd have like vegetables with avocado or guacamole. Or if you have a piece of fruit, you have some raw nuts with it or something. So you want it, a big thing is never eat fruit alone. So that's one thing I feel like people can walk away and remember, right? Because fruit is good for us, but it gives us that spike in blood sugar. So we don't want that. We want to make sure that our, our, um, our blood sugar doesn't go up too quickly. So, uh, so those are kind of the basic rules. And then for nutrient timing, once you find that you start to put in more fat, you can go longer between your meals. And so even with a high volume, you should be able to eat three meals a day, one or two snacks in there, and maybe even no snacks. It just depends on the volume that you're training. And, um, and you want to eat, again, the more starchy carbohydrates at night. And then you can play around with a fasted workout, but I want people to be really careful about that. So fasted workouts, which would be typically in the morning with no food in you whatsoever, maybe some coffee, maybe adding some coconut oil to your coffee or some type of fat to it. But you want to be careful about that. It's not, it's, it shouldn't be done by somebody that has adrenal issues or adrenal fatigue, if you've heard of that, thyroid issues, um, reproductive hormone issues, fertility, things like that. Um, so you want to be really careful about that. But assuming that you're healthy, you can get up and go do a workout with just the coffee or with nothing. But you want to take some amino acids. Um, I like a full spectrum amino acids, not just the branch chain amino acids. Two to three grams of it and take that before you go because that's going to protect your muscles. Otherwise, your body will break down muscles to get it because it can make glucose from the muscles. So we don't want that to happen. And you can go do... Um, like 30 minutes of intensity or 60 minutes of low intensity. And then when I work with athletes, we can kind of start to stretch that out. But again, it's a very individualized thing, and you have to see how your body adjusts to that. And that will upregulate the fat burning quite a bit. So, um, so go ahead and play around with it. Try it. I had been – so I started this a little over two years ago, and then I did the Boulder Ironman last summer in August. And I completely changed my nutrition from the Ironman before that, the horrible one. And I really didn't need to take it much. I took in 376 calories over the 12 hours it took me to do it, which a lot of people take that in in one hour. And I had a great race. I had a PR and finished ninth in my age group. So check it out. <clears throat>